I begin today by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. My name is Rebecca and I'll be facilitating today's webinar. This webinar is a series of Connect and Learn webinars designed to support AOD clinicians throughout Victoria. The series is funded by the Department of Health and hosted by Turning Point. We want today to be interactive, so please ask questions via the Q&A function, not the chat function. Please ask your questions as they come to you rather than um, leaving them all to the end when it's, it's hard for me to collate and get them to the presenters. We encourage you to stay to the end um, and complete the exit survey. There will be a QR code on the last slide um, for you to complete uh, your feedback for today. And also we'll send it to you via email. The presenters have kindly agreed to share their slides, so they will be made available to you uh, in the near future. Now I'd like to introduce our presenters, Associate Professor Victoria Manning and Dan Raphael. Victoria Manning is an Associate Professor in Addictions at Monash University and Head of Research and Workforce Development here at Turning Point. She's a research psychologist and holds a PhD on neurocognition and co-occurring disorders. She's worked um, in addiction treatment services for over 20 years in the UK, Asia and Australia. Her primary research interests are trialing novel interventions to improve outcomes for people with substance use disorders, include neuroscience informed interventions, psychological and pharmacological treatments and mutual aid. She has published over 130 papers and has written multiple treatment guidelines. She also oversees and lectures on the Masters of Addictive Behaviours course at Monash. She's also a board member of VADA, a Smart Recovery Facilitator, and is a member of the International Research Advisory Committee to Smart Recovery. She's conducted multiple studies examining the impact of peer support and mutual aid, group, uh, aid groups like AA, NA, and Smart Recovery on treatment outcomes and led a chapter on this topic in the recently revised Australian Alcohol Treatment Guidelines. Dan Raphael is the National Program Manager and trainer with Smart Recovery Australia. Originally from Scotland, Dan has 18 years experience working in addiction recovery, peer education, youth and, and homeless sectors in the UK and Australia. Dan's qualifications include an honours degree in addiction studies, diplomas in integrated counselling, cognitive behaviour therapy and certificates in mental health and health and social care. Dan has a real passion seeing people who are experiencing addictive behaviours gain more control over their lives. He strongly believes in peer support and those seeking recovery are the experts in themselves. His desire is to see participants equipped with the necessary tools and strategies and being uh, empowered to live more balanced and fulfilled lives. This has been validated, validated through his own journey and lived experience of addiction many years ago. Thank you so much, both of you. And thank you, Dan, for joining us from another state. Uh, I'll hand it over to you, Dan. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. It was a very warm welcome. Um, so I just want to share a little bit in the next 15, 20 minutes uh, around Smart Recovery. And then and Vic's going to share about how Smart has been collaborating um, down in Victoria um, and embedded in the AOD services. So who are we? Who we are? Uh, Smart Recovery, ultimately our vision, Smart Recovery, not just in Australia, but globally, is to make Smart uh, accessible to, to everyone and, and, and relevant to everybody. Um, the programme, the key components of it around self-management, choice, and that we work through harm minimization, which as we know is a, a very broad spectrum. Um, very evidence-led, uh, person-centred and non-judgmental in its essence. Now, it's very structured format that we do uh, run these groups with. Um, and the participant-led agenda effectively support with a trained facilitator. So everyone that facilitates these smart recoveries of uh, meetings have been uh, completed uh, online or face-to-face -face training. Uh, and in Australia, it's been great. We've had a lot of uh, collaborative uh, work with services that run them. Uh, we're increasing our, our peer workforce as well, or not so much workforce, but peer engagement with facilitators. Uh, but places like America and stuff are very strong on the peer focus as well, which is fantastic. And it is a very practical, uh, evidence-based program, looking at the kind of seven-day goals in between each meeting, 
what uh, ways you can plan and make some small changes around problematic behaviour. Uh, some of the philosophies that underpin it, which are very strong and evidence-based, as we know, is cognitive behavioural therapy and, and motivational interviewing. Uh, and we're fortunate to be running since 94, uh, when it started in America. And Australia has been here since 2004, and uh, when it got piloted in St Vincent's Hospital. Uh, and now in 31 countries, which um, we can see that it transcends uh, culture and uh, ethnicity and different communities that it's embedding in, it's really encouraging to see that continue to grow. Pre-COVID, which is a term we use now, which is a term none of us like, <laughs> but pre-COVID we were up at about 360 meetings a week. Um, and but fortunately we were already primed in 2019 to uh, have online meetings and online trainings. It was like we had a crystal ball. So we were able to maintain uh, a real steady flow of meetings throughout 20 and 2021. So what really is it? Uh, well, it's a practical uh, group support program. Self-management mutual aid is, I guess, the essence of it. So SMART stands for Self-Management and Recovery Program. It's a weekly group. These meetings normally would run for about 90 minutes. Um, some groups, maybe uh, youth groups or indigenous uh, groups that are run, they choose to run them for a little less time. Uh, but we're really, the 90 minutes we find is enough time for the national average that attend maybe seven, seven or eight um, in these meetings is a good a time uh, to get through what we need to. We talk about the four point programme, which is on the right hand side, this little diagram here. Effectively, these are the kind of four areas that um, we feel that cover most of the things that we end up talking about. And sometimes good even just for an agenda, if someone's really struggling and not sure how to approach that. But we do know that building and maintaining motivation is key to, to the beginning of change anyway, uh, and working through them not so much in a, um, a sequential step, um, like the 12 steps, um, because we can be talking about many aspects of this in one conversation as well. And uh, we're very heavily um, driven by the Research Advisory Committee, which um, uh, Professor Manning is involved in as well. Um, the structure of the meetings. So whether these are face-to-face -face or online, uh, we try and stick to this uh, pretty straightforward structure, which is just check-ins, a minute or two with each individual about really finding out what's been going on for them or how the last week has been and what they want to work on a specific kind of agenda item. And that's the stage where you can get quite overwhelmed because there's so many things that's going on for people. And it's really important to hone in on the, on the hierarchy or the value that they really want to address first and, and work on that. Uh, and then the work time is where we open up for a group discussion and where the mutual aid aspect of it, it becomes very powerful. The facilitators are there just to guide that. Um, you may know the word facilitate means to ease the process. And I love that idea that we're there just there to help the process along, but it's them that take ownership and over change. And the checkouts at the end again, when they get to that, this is what I want to do this week, this is what I want to work on, and I feel confident that I can at least work that. And um, we're just really um, cementing that and um, really wrapping up the meeting. As over there, right, we can work worksheets and different things that I'll um, just um, get into later on in October. So I guess when we think about um, wonderful services like you guys, and we're involved in many of you, I'm sure, um, working with Smart Recovery, but why it's so effective in these services is there's an immediate opportunity for connection support. Uh, it's quick access. Um, the research shows that quick access translates to better outcomes. So um, there's an immediate opportunity for people to engage when there's wait lists or there's pre-admission and they can't get into rehabs or um, there's very degrees of, of, of barriers that are um, in the way of engaging in treatment. We find that these meetings and the communities and through the services are a great soft entry point to come into when maybe they're not quite ready to, to detox or to stop or you know really small steps and it helps really um, engage them at that early stage. And through that, um, it shows that a really high level of, of, of statistics come through about how people feel really welcome, supported, and, and connected when they um, engage in them. Um, so the resource efficient group format, and really it's about any behavior of concern. And this is what I love about it because it transcends drugs or just alcohol. Uh, when we get into it, sometimes we know that it's not just that, it can be a byproduct or, a, or an end result of other issues going on. And I've had some real doozies in some of my meetings. You, yeah, you have your alcohol and your, and your drugs and things. The most bizarre one I've had was someone said to me at check-in, 
I've got an a Sudoku addiction, and I was like, inside I was rolling my hair, <laughs> a Sudoku addiction, and I was like, felt like saying, oh, like, are you for real? Like, obviously I didn't, but it's non-judgmental. But when you get into discussing it, I found out that he was actually had a, an issue with hoarding, and he was having fights with his wife, and to escape that, he went to play games because he was in his, you know, he was an elderly chap. He didn't have game stations or drugs. He went to play games in his study, and, and that's how it transpired that he felt he had that. Um, and it was amazing where we just end up small steps. He ended up just clearing his table, just pushing it all on the floor and having a dinner with his wife. And that was his only plan this week. And it was amazing just to see the small steps. It could be any behavior of concern, which really destigmatizes um, the, the environment that. Uh, can really come uh, so often. Um, and as we say, we may share some of the stats that Vic, um, hopefully they're correct, but we did pull them from the paper that came from the pilot. <laughs> um, that uh, They reported a huge uh, reduction and uh, difference in, in abstinence from the previous week. It's <clears throat> uh, a real safe space, warm and accepting, you know, uh, these obviously we know these are important things but to build rapport and bring barriers down for people that feel really anxious and worried about coming into those types of sins. Um, and the self-determination is that the control is put back into their hands. People can engage in services because they feel a lack of control um, and they're just, things are just going chaotic. So really creating a space that's safe for them just to choose and take control over one aspect of their life and work on that and build self-efficacy around that is so key. And through that peer support, uh, the mutual aid aspect of it. As facilitators, I train them to say, you are not the expert. You may have 20, 30 years experience, and so do I, but I've got to take that side and, and just um, help draw out what's going to work for them uh, through the peer support and the mutual aid aspect of it. And I just find it astounding um, that I've done weeks of one-on-one -on -one work with some people before, yet I've got better outcomes in 10 or 15 minutes in the mutual aid aspect of it. It's amazing to watch and it's very flexible. Um, when we talk about safety, obviously safe, but in regards to harmonization as well, um, but also certain specific demographics of cohorts, you know, there may be um, youth meetings or women meetings, um, women only or LGBTQI meetings. So these are kind of safe parameters for people also to engage in services. But for the most, we do try and keep it a, an open, um, open type group because we will have to continue kind of working together collaboratively and living in the community, engaging in the community in different ways as well. And I'll touch briefly on the family involvement, but there is a holistic um, approach to it as well, where you could have a, a family member going through smart recovery, but then the parents are going through family and friends, and they can work this holistically and, and, and collaboratively as a family, which is um, a fantastic um, yeah, opportunity for people to do as well. I'm not covering off all these quotes, you can read them at your own convenience as we go through the, the presentation. I put a, a power to the individual first. Um, they are empowered and we're creating this environment for them to empower themselves. I find um, through learning, through making mistakes, and I don't even necessarily like calling it lapses sometimes, they're just behaviours that are probably not favourable to you and where you want to be. So it's learning through that and, and giving them the power that they can use them as, as a benefit, as a strength. Um, I'm always reflecting on going to the gym when I'm out of lockdown and, and you come out with sore muscles. And I'm like, oh, gee whiz. At first you're like, I don't want to do that again. But then if I keep going back and working those muscles, those sore muscles are the very strong, the strongest muscles in my body. And that's why I encourage people that you can take control of this, even your mistakes, can be a benefit and a strength if you if you use them and utilize them. The iterative nature of it is about speaking out and goal setting and committing to what you want to achieve. Not anyone else, you're not accountable to us or anyone else in the group. What do you want to achieve? What do you want to get out of it? And it's that self-confidence and the building of self-efficacy, which is real key to motivation and success. And um, as you can see, increasing self-esteem, assertiveness and agency. If you don't have small steps, if you don't achieve those first small steps, then you, it's very difficult to build self-esteem. And I find sometimes when people come into recovery, there are so many facets in their life that they need to fix. It's so overwhelming. It's just that I can't do it. You're just focusing on this one thing, the most immediate thing. Let's work on that. How do you break that down into small goals? 
people can come in with a plan of wanting to stop drinking and they've never stopped for 20 years, 30 years. And all they walk away with is make that one phone call or talk to that one friend or just work on that one thing. And when they do that, more chance of doing more and building confidence and that self-esteem. Um, and as I said, through all domains, really, we're talking about, you know, when you when you break down some of the, 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 the antecedents and some of the driving factors to addiction, it's, it's no different to any of us. I'm sure many of us are, uh, you know, I mean, still struggling off the, the back of Netflix and Stan and chocolate binges. And, you know, when you break that down and you work through the psychology of it, it's really no different. And I think that really helps other people empower themselves and making better decisions beyond the addictive behavior cycles that we find themselves in. And as you say, there's a lot of research around the feedback from peers. And I don't know about you, but most people don't listen to the experts and tell them what to do. You know, if you can find it within yourself, that own strength, that own determination yourself, or you hear it from people that are going through the same thing, people in your shoes, you're more likely to take that on and want to achieve what you hope for. Power to the group. So this is where the mutual aid aspects comes into it. Uh, it is about engaging participation. Now, there will be time when it's a little bit of conversations one-on-one, -on -one, but we're always looking to draw the group into this discussion. What do other people think about that? How have other people dealt with stress or managing anger? Or So we're always looking for that open discussion and work time as well. Um, sometimes there's really inappropriate things that come up, which as facilitators, we need to use the skills to um, just contain that, but also use it as a positive thing. Um, you know, some people might just come up and say, oh, well, I got off meth because I started smoking pot, so I should try that. I mean, not an ideal thing to see in a group. So as a facilitator, we need to see that actually they're talking about helping themselves relax and things. So it's really important to say that we, we're not encouraging other um, substances or we're looking for healthier ways to make change. So there are other ways that's helped you relax or other things that you can suggest. So it's about really keeping that a safe space, but not feeling judged that actually that was helpful for them, but it might not be for other people. And we can't obviously um, condone these other things, but we're trying to draw out some positive things that anyone in any de um, demographic in life can receive and give advice. I've seen 19 year old methamphetamine users living on the street giving advice to a director of a company because of the level playing field we create when it's just talking about anger or stress or these normal things that everyone's experiencing. I don't think you would see that very often in day-to-day -day life if you haven't created that environment. Um, and important just about self-esteem and social isolation as well, you know, being around peers, people that are like-minded and want to try and make change is really key. And the cohesion, there's a lot of research, I say we'll leave some references at the end as well. Um, if you're really bored one night and trying to get to sleep, and Netflix and chocolate's just not doing it. Um, we can highlight a lot of the cohesion about what's created in these groups is really, really powerful. It's meeting the changing needs. So we do understand that recovery and journey is not linear. Uh, we talk about the stages of change and that's not just one thing. You could be in multiple layers of stages of change. So what are we talking about today? What are we working on today? And it's not this linear thing. People can fluctuate and change and motivation is, is so, um, flexible it just goes all over so we really need to work and adapt and, and help um, identify what it is they're talking about specifically today they want to work on uh, and we said any life challenges uh, motivation is key if you find yourself unmotivated to go to the gym or to clean up after yourself after dinner or do the hoovering you're probably going to find yourself unmotivated to do other bigger things as well so it's really key to, as I say, that's the main point. One of the first points is building maintain motivation. Uh, and as I say, through general mental well-being, uh, there's a huge significant um, uh, increase of that when we see through um, the smart meets, which is really encouraging just to deal with other day-to-day -day life things, which we find um, are the, the, the main, sometimes the main contributors to people falling into addictive cycles. Um, I'm going to say we've, we've, we're really strong on the evidence base, but we'll move on to this thing. So a program that fits all the mutual aid amplifies and extends treatment effects. So the research is coming out that when you're embedding smart recovery into services, um, it, it can enhance the, the recovery journey for people when it's in collaboration with other um, treatments and other services. So we're not saying that smart fits all for every single thing. 
but it's a really key aspect of behavioral change, the mutual aid, self-management aspect, and it would work very complementary in a combination um, of other professional treatments. Um, it isn't therapy. I say that to many people, this is not therapy, it's therapeutic, but we're not here to help you dig through this trauma and stuff. So it's about keeping safe and making sure that you're referring or self-managing that in different ways. So really that um, collaborative um, uh, way of, of working together in different treatment modalities as well. Um, and uh, we are very aligned to, with this client centre. We talk about that all the time. But in essence, uh, it is driven by um, our self-determination and self-motivation, self-management. So uh, this is an online kind of slide. So 2019, as I say, they all started going pear shaped towards the end of 2019 for many people. And a lot of services, we had thousands of participants disengaging from services completely. 150 services shut on the doors. So we were fortunate to stay online, and I'm sure many of your services have adapted to that over the last year or two. Um, but we um, have found some great um, insights into that, and I've got other uh, uh, reports and different research that we can share with you that some of our other research advisory committee did an evaluation on online programs in the last year that we had run. Um, but these also are a great way to maintain um, services online as well, working with Smart Recovery. Um, especially when we still don't really fully know <laughs> if we're through COVID and whatever that means. Uh, but anyway, even in remote areas and different hard to engage areas is really key to have online options, which we do. Um, and as you can see, the, the statistics again, and I'm not fudging these, I'm not pulling any of these just to make us look good. We're just so encouraged to see that actually um, people that are engaging online are seeing it the same or better for their needs. Um, we have a lot more females attending, a lot more people like principals of schools that don't want to go to a face-to-face -face meeting in their, in their area, which is uh, fantastic to see as well. Um, and, it, and it shows, evidence is showing it's actually just as effective, which, um, which is really encouraging to hear because it's kind of a world we're all getting used to right now. Um, we'll talk about staff training and things like that, and we're we'll always open to questions at the end, but um, even the feedback around the online training has been really, really encouraging, and you can see some, um, some comments and quotes there from that. So very, very briefly, we talked about Smart Family and Friends program as well. So that's a, an additional training. So the training that we will talk about in just a minute is a two-day facilitator training, which is the bread and butter. Then you do that, but you can do a, a one-day family and friends program, which then you run a course for family members. So I like to see it as family members putting their own oxygen mask on because if I'm not breathing and coping, I'm never going to help, never going to help Jimmy. Um, it's not to get Jimmy off drugs. He can engage in the services that he finds appropriate and self-manages. But I'm going to self-manage myself so that I can create a better environment that's supportive and caring and loving and nurturing so that Jimmy can make good decisions for himself as well. So that's another course that we've been finding really, really effective. Uh, and that can be run as a kind of eight week session really um, and periodically through the year. So it doesn't need to be a big commitment um, to, to, to your service. Um, so our key strategic focus in SMART is collaboration and working with you guys because we have nothing. We are a team of seven that <laughs> covers the whole of Australia and New Zealand. And um, we are really reliant upon volunteers and peers and engaging in services. As I said, uh, there are many services that we engage in uh, that cover across pre-treatment, treatment, post-treatment, post um, whether that's you know, pre-detox or moving into residential or even in clinical settings or, or hospital settings, and also um, post-treatment community. And a lot of services, they just shut the door and, and, and they're back into the community. They go back into their day-to-day -day life with their family and friends who are using it. It's about having that consistency through the whole, um, the whole journey for people in our services, which is key. Uh, many of the services that we do run, uh, 100 plus, but some of them they'd be very familiar with and we've been a fantastic uh, partner with Turning Point over the years as well. But really encouraging to know that it can you know, fit into any service, any, any type of modality. So when it comes to training, uh, the great thing about it, we have online and face-to-face -face training. Now, face-to-face -face training kind of been paused for a while, as you know. Uh, we are starting to look into releasing or, or, or engaging back into that as well. But not that that's any better or worse, because we have online options that actually serve a very different purpose as well. 
and I'm going to be training people in Broome that have their services spread over a thousand kilometers. It's just going to be really difficult to do face-to-face -face training with them. So we're providing them options of a kind of online premium where we um, engage in them quite intensely in online, which has been fantastic as well. It also maintains staff training, professional development and a high staff turnover because you can engage in, in so much money as services, engaging in training and the, and the, and the staff are gone and then you're back to square one. So online training is a really quick, easy way to get people trained up again in smart recovery. There's a vibrant e-learning course as well, um, and uh, you can quickly retrain them within you know, a few weeks, hopefully, um, yeah. to get them up and running if you needed to. Um, as we said, everyone is trained uh, over a two, at least minimum two days face-to-face -face in the online, which is a four-module course and then a practice session. Um, and again, the statistics and the, and the research and the data that are coming out is extremely encouraging. So we're, we're, we're fortunate um, to, to have people that are very engaged and very much enjoying um, both, both ways and, of training. Beyond training, we offer a kind of open door policy for, for services and peers and volunteers, either through refresher trainings to continually tweak those skills, engaging in smart recovery and other like-minded services. We've been running fortnightly facilitator support sessions for people that are running meetings in their services that they can just join in and you know, just troubleshoot with other like-minded facilitators across Australia uh, and, and just continue to work collaboratively. Uh, professional development webinars, we can direct you to our website under the resources tab. We've been uh, fortunate to have many um, fantastic webinars on there, including uh, Carlo Di Clemente, who, who, who knew the trans theoretical model stages of change. Uh, Dr. Bill Miller has been on there as well, so we've been fortunate and uh, they're um, accessible for you even um, now, um, but also keep an eye on the future webinars coming up. We've got other ways to engage facilitators through private Facebook networks and just an open door policy really um, as dedicated support for myself and one of the other national program managers. Um, I say you, you get an answer unless I'm on our leave, you'll get an answer that day and I'll do my best to respond and support the services that do engage in SMART. So it's a I want to say lifelong, because you know, I'll be 60 year old and I'll still be getting phone calls about smart recovery, but um, as long as we can engage, we want to continue working with you guys as best as we can. Um, other resources that we have available are the manuals as well. So there are handbooks and participant handbooks. When you do the training, you get a new facilitator handbook, which is kind of the smart Bible. And when I first trained in smart, I just kept reading it and reading it and reading it. And I did the training and I was still a terrible facilitator, but as I continually worked at it and used the resources that SMART had, so you start honing your skills and, and growing in confidence. And through that as well, we have a lot of suite of resources around um, worksheets that some of you may have even downloaded and used already, but we have editable worksheets we've uploaded on our website as well. So people are engaging online, they can use the cost benefits, the ABC type model tools and different uh, resources that are available. In the Smart Track app, um, I might show you, and apologies, I've got a video um, I will show you, um, and hopefully uh, it doesn't crash. Uh, the audio doesn't have any speaking over it, so it might just be a really bad um, sounding quality in the background, but it's just a 20 second promo video around the Smart Track app. Yeah, so that came out of a 2019 research pilot of monitoring the routine outcome monitoring project and we've continued to it's available for download on android or um sound going through. Uh, that's available on download and um what is making that noise? i don't know where that's going from um, but that's available for download on our website as well for android and um, apple uh, and that's been proven effective uh, just to help people through that recovery journey week in, week out, helping log their RGs, make their plans and do you know, keep track of their progress as well, which is fantastic. Uh, and if you're really, really bored, I can send these to you. Uh, but it's just some of the references around the research that we had. And, and we're going to hear from um, 
Vicar a little second around some of the stuff that we've been working on as well. But that's about it for me. Uh, thank you for your patience with tech and various different things going on. But I appreciate the time today and I'll hand you over to Victoria. Thanks, Dan. Thanks for that brilliant overview of the smart recovery model. Um, I think it's it's really good to get a sense of what exactly smart aims to achieve. Uh, and it's very helpful in terms of putting the, the results I'm about to present into context. So there's now a substantial body of evidence on the benefits of attending mutual aid and peer support. There was a recent Cochrane review by John Kelly, which pulled the findings from 27 trials of AA and 12-step facilitation and found it to be actually more effective than CBT for achieving continuous abstinence 12 months later. Uh, and also a paper by Keith Humphreys in 2020, which pulled the findings from six randomized control trials on people with drug use disorders. And this found that attending 12 step groups was actually associated with greater reductions in illicit drug use and related problems. Closer to home, we have the patient pathway study, which examined 12 month outcomes in 800 clients attending AOD services in Victoria and WA. And this found that attending mutual aid, and in this case, it was predominantly AA and NA, this doubled the likelihood of them achieving treatment success with more frequent attendance associated with even better outcomes, as you can see from the figure on the left-hand side. However, in Victorian AOD services, peer support is largely limited to residential treatment settings and residential rehab setting episodes represent only 16% of all episodes of treatment in Victoria. So what this means is we really need to find new ways for strengthening pathways into peer support from community-based services. And that was very much the impetus behind the current study. So the study was funded by the Department of Health Victoria, and we aim to test whether smart recovery can be embedded in AOD treatment. We selected smart recovery for all the reasons you've just heard Dan talk about, really. It's a form of peer support and mutual aid that is very closely aligned with what's typically delivered in the Victorian AOD treatment system, being strengths-based, client-centered, and one that embraces harm reduction as well as abstinence and draws very heavily on MI and CBT tools. So we set out to explore the uptake, attendance rates, and benefits in three different AOD services and we used a mixed methods approach, combining qualitative interview data with quantitative data from surveys. And really this was looking at the experiences from a, both a consumer or group participant perspective, a facilitator perspective, as well as a service manager perspective. The interviews from the sort of facilitator angle really explored barriers and facilitators to running groups to elicit practical considerations to support the wider rollout if, they were, if that was justified from the results of the study. So we put out a expression of interest, uh, sorry, a call for an expression of interest to be a pilot site. And we selected three from the, I think it was 20 submissions that we had. Uh, this was two in Metropolitan Melbourne. So we had Odyssey in Footscray and the Kickstart program of the Eastern AOD Consortium, which has a forensic focus. Uh, unfortunately, during the course of that, during the course of the study, due to staff departures, we then had to, or turning point, then had to pick up that that particular group, uh, and then we also had a regional service, Ballarat Community Health, and in total, we had eight clinicians and two peer workers trained in the smart recovery model. So that's two full days of training, and they had ongoing supervision from Smart Recovery Australia and support from the research team. Some of the groups got started towards the end of 2019, but of course, once we were hit with COVID, we had to transition online. And this meant that we had to also adapt some of our data collection methods. But in total, we still managed to hold 78 meetings and in total, we had 486 attendances. You can see 138 of those were in person and the rest were online. And we had survey responses from a total of 103 participants and we conducted 23 qualitative interviews across those three groups. So once the online groups were established, there was an average of 16 groups running per month. And overall, the number of meetings and the number of participants increased steadily over the eight month um, duration of the study, demonstrating that there was interest and demand for smart recovery. And as you can see from this figure, it took a while to get established with those online groups, but I'm extremely grateful to the facilitators and in their willingness to keep going with this so we could keep going with the study and to transition online. I'm really pleased to say that in fact all three pilot sites in this study are still running smart recovery group meetings today more than a year after the study has been completed. So that's great. 
Okay, so onto the data then. The first set was from those who attended in-person groups and completed what was more of a, a, a more detailed survey. This survey included the treatment effectiveness assessment, which is a person-centered outcome tool where clients consider and score the degree of change that's most relevant to their personal goals across four domains. And we adapted it to capture deterioration as well as improvement. So the first domain is changes in substance use. And you can see here that two thirds reported a positive change in their use of their primary drug of concern. And in fact, almost all of those in the no change category were actually successfully maintaining either abstinence or a substantial reduction in use of their primary drug of concern following on from their successful treatment episode. On the second domain of health, around two thirds reported a positive change in their physical health, and you can see that from the, the purple bar, and around three quarters reported a positive change in their mental health and well-being, shown by the orange bars. For the lifestyle domain, which looks at things like housing, living situation, family, employment and relationships, three quarters reported being better at taking care of their personal responsibilities, as you can see from the purple bars. And for the fourth one, which is community and really feeling part of society, three quarters reported feeling better connected with others, as you can see from the purple bars. So orange bars, sorry. Now, in terms of overall benefits, around nine out of 10 agreed that they had benefited in terms of better managing their addictive behaviours, being able to cope with life's challenges and feeling supported by members of the groups. Having then pivoted to online meetings, Smart Recovery Australia conduct their own post-meeting surveys, and we found that this had been completed by 30 of the participants who were attending our, one of our three pilot sites, most of whom reported alcohol as their primary drug of concern. And you can see here the vast majority, around nine out of 10, agreed or strongly agreed that they felt welcome, supported and understood by those attending the meeting and had the opportunity to contribute to discussion. Only one person reported finding it unhelpful. And in fact, all of them indicated an intention to continue smart recovery meetings. So in summary, these responses from the two surveys suggested that the vast majority of participants benefited in terms of uh, improved substance use, uh, management of their substance use, improved health and well-being, and feeling better connected whilst attending the groups and had positive experiences of, of attending them. So moving on to the qualitative data, there's a lot here and I'm just gonna give you a sort of overview of what we found. We used a framework approach to thematic analysis for the three sets of qualitative interviews. So for the 10 participant interviews, eight themes emerged, each with two or three sub themes, as you can see in this table. I'll just try to give you a feel or a flavor for some of these with some of the illustrative quotes. So in this theme of motivation to attend, where was this sub, the sub theme of smart recovery as an alternative to 12 step and that seemed to be very appealing for some. One participant said, I like the fact that if I'm abstaining, I get support. But if I change my mind and I want to try and manage my drinking, I get support. I'm not left alone. Another said, I also think just having that short term goal and planning for the week ahead and then coming back and talking about how you went and what you can do differently. Like it's really easy to make small adjustments and move on. And within this sort of theme, several participants alluded to using the sort of collective wisdom of the group to really tweak their seven day plans and that that could help foster this sort of incremental growth um, or progress or in mastery, which relates to building self-efficacy that you heard Dan talk about. So within the theme of connecting with others, the sub theme of sharing knowledge, experiences and resources and reciprocity in relating to one another and helping others and giving back came through very clearly. So one of them said, I like sharing with other people and it's nice seeing people in the first stages of their recovery and helping them because I'm 15 months clean now. So it's awesome to give back because I would have loved to have received that when I was in their position. And another told us it's peer support and you can bounce off each other. It's made so much easier because there are so many people who can relate to my situation and it's been heartwarming and just such a great experience. Another thing that emerged was around perceptions of quality assurance with groups being run by treatment providers. So one of them told us, I've been a client of this site for years and also given consumer feedback. So I kind of know 
I, I know the kind of high quality organization it is, which adds a great deal of weight to their meeting. It's like a guarantee almost of quality. And another one told us, I was aware that the group was connected to this site, but didn't know much about it. It probably swayed me and I looked for ones connected to treatment services and services with a good reputation like this one. In fact, several of the participants within this theme suggested that it could offer a way of providing a sort of gentle or more trusted introduction to smart recovery before transitioning to groups run entirely by the community. Within the theme of future considerations was a sub theme of the format of the meetings with them being either online or in person. Many recognize the advantages of having online meetings, the convenience of not having to travel and, and, and it enabling a broader mix of participants. And even the Zoom platform itself was, was uh, considered to have its advantages in that facilitators could send private messages to participants and participants could share resources and messages with the entire group via the chat function. But others um, felt that there was something missing from online meetings. Those who had attended face-to-face -face meetings, they felt that yeah, the sort of more organic bonding and that connection with other group members was not so easy to achieve and certainly not um, emulated as easily online and, and that talking could sometimes feel a bit more stilted and structured. But there was also the recognition that for some people who may be more an anxious or, uh, you know, uh, intimidated by attending a, a large in-group uh, in-person meeting, the online format allowed sort of that greater anonymity and a sense of safety for those perhaps who were new to the smart recovery. So it definitely had its advantages as well. So themes emerging from the clinicians or peer facilitators really centered around the barriers and facilitators to running successful groups. An important facilitator theme was having support from their service managers. And that meant providing the necessary resources for them to run groups. So allocating them with a room and providing admin support and really just recognizing that it was a legitimate role uh, or a legitimate part of their service delivery. Education emerged as another theme with several noting there's a need to raise awareness of what smart recovery is among clinicians and colleagues so that they can educate clients, perhaps dispel some of the myths and misconceptions so that they are better placed to make referrals. Program integrity emerged as another theme with many in favor of its structure and its principles and more manualized approach. And in fact, many indicated that the training and facilitation had actually been beneficial for their personal development, especially for those who typically only deliver one-on-one uh, -on -one treatment and perhaps are less experienced at running um, groups. In fact, one told us it's been really enjoyable and I've learned a lot, but it's also had quite a few challenges for me in terms of my presentation skills and listening skills. So it's taught me a lot. Another theme related to its emphasis on diversity and inclusion and with suggestions that it, you know, it really does cater for all demographic backgrounds, all stages of a person's treatment journey or recovery journey, and for all types of substance use disorders. As you can see with this quote on the left, your diagnosis doesn't matter to us. We leave those labels at the door. And then you can say, this is what SMART stands for, real solutions using the power in the room. Facilitator responsibilities emerged as another theme and was possibly one of the own, only or few themes where there were some negative or challenges, negative experiences or challenges identified. And this was around the need to maintain participant safety, particularly in the online groups when they were attended by participants who may not be known by the service. Several noted that there was sometimes that oversharing of distressing information around sensitive issues like offense, serious offenses or experiences of violence, which could be triggering for some participants. So there was some skill needed in, in managing that. Uh, another thing that emerged was around how it integrates with treatment, recognizing that it can support clients who may be waiting on wait lists for inpatient withdrawal, for example, but also offer adjunctive treatment or uh, treatment and adjunctive form of support for those who are receiving counseling treatment, as well as provide a form of post treatment aftercare. In fact, one of them told us it enables them to deliver an evidence-based program without expending extra energy and time developing group plans and activities. The final theme for the facilitators was around how it can be implemented with recommendations to run them at venues that are close to public transport, at times that are convenient, catering ideally for the needs of clients with childcare and employment commitments, 
Some were in favour of running specific groups, for example, women-only groups or groups only for, for those with forensic issues. Others felt that, um, you know, this would kind of go against the, the strengths of the smart recovery model, which is that it's, it's really for, for everybody. I also wanted to highlight another important theme, which was around the type of facilitator. Surprisingly, few participants and few facilitators seem to comment on this issue. Uh, there were certain facilitators recognise that the two having having a facilitator who identified as somebody with lived experience and clinicians who may or may not have their own lived experience um, or experience um, supporting somebody with an alcohol or drug problem. They were generally not seen as as distinct, uh, but rather more complementary. In fact, one told us a peer led thing is really good, and that's why I'm involved to have that peer aspect. But there's two sides to it because we have clients in intoxicated states and, and really tough states, and sometimes they have an acquired brain injury, and sometimes it's good to have a clinician there. However, facilitators did recognize that we do need to attract more peers with lived experience to facilitate groups and that there needs to be consideration to ensure that all those costs, facilitator costs and ongoing are covered and ongoing support and supervision uh, is provided, particularly when they're running groups in the community so that they, um, they are sustained. One of, one of the facilitators told us there's no peers. Most people who really benefit go on to get jobs and live their lives. So they so don't really get put through the training to become a facilitator. They need money to live. Finally, the what we found from the service manager interviews indicated that they were broadly supportive of implementing smart recovery groups. The themes that emerged centered around managing risks, managing resources and managing stakeholder needs. So juggling sort of wanting to offer flexibility and professional development opportunities to staff with prioritizing the needs for clients, as well as recon reconciling these with their reporting obligations on, on funded activities. In fact, one of the managers told us, we're not technically funded to do a group, although, you know, it does fit, fit into the guidelines, but you know, we're just doing the work in a different way, I guess. So if there were standalone funding, a funded treatment type, that would be great. It would be much more straightforward that way. So to summarise what we found, what we concluded was it is indeed feasible to embed smart recovery groups in community AOD services. There was considerable interest in the smart recovery model with attendance growing steadily over time. And like I said, that some all three services are still running at least one smart recovery group. So that's just brilliant. Participants had positive experiences and reported multiple benefits on top of their usual treatment. So that was improved substance use, health and well-being and connection to others and being better able to manage themselves. And whilst, of course, the limitation of the study is that we cannot attribute those benefits solely to the fact that they were also attending smart recovery groups. Many of them did report that they'd seen those changes since they'd started attending groups and generally around 90 percent experienced positive um, had positive experiences from attending those groups. Facilitators were clearly strong advocates and they were very keen to see the program continue, but they also recognise that it requires significant investment and commitment from multiple parties to keep doing that. Managers could see the benefits, but recognise the challenges with it being an unfunded activity. And finally, whilst most were in favour of the combined clinician or peer facilitator led model, there is a clear need to attract more peers with lived experience to run to run these groups. And in total, we had 18 recommendations from this work. The main one was firstly for the Department of Health to consider the wider rollout of embedding smart recovery and treatment and to explore ways in which it could become a funded activity or service offering. And it's really important to say here, whilst we have demonstrated its success with these particular sites, with the smart recovery um, form of peer support. It's by no means the only form of peer support mutual aid that's out there. Many, many services are already running their own groups. And so this is certainly, a, you know, there are others that could meet this need. We recommend investment in strategies to raise awareness among staff in AOD services and referral agencies in the smart recovery model so they can promote smart recovery and refer clients to optimize treatment success. We recommend that the needs of clients at a local level are considered when making decisions about the format and the way in which they run their groups. 
A recommendation was that the ideal group size should be around eight to 10 clients and ideally offering both online and uh, in-person options would be desirable. And whilst we didn't measure this in the current study, it's likely to be a cost effective way of providing this form of support, given that it could be run just by one or two clinicians and they could serve maybe 10 or more clients during that 90 minute period, or even having a clinician and a peer or, or, or a peer or two peers, it's really going to be a, a cost effective way of providing this additional support to clients. We recommend that service managers allocate sufficient resources, perhaps a minimum of two trained staff to allow flexibility in facilitator working hours and load, and as a number of the facilitators noted, to have it recognized as part of what they do. Another recommendation was that services consider some form of a sort of forum or platform, perhaps a community of practice, where peers and clinician facilitators can come together and engage in debriefing and provide ongoing, um, provide and receive ongoing supervision. And lastly, that services and facilitators support clients and uh, to become well, as clients to to uh, give that smart recovery, um, give it a go, I guess, but also for peer facilitators to really look out for suitable participants in their groups who could be supported to become peer facilitators themselves and to make sure they're appropriately reimbursed for their time so that these continue to run um, and are sustained. So if you'd like to know more about the evidence of smart recovery in general, I just wanted to, to um, mention the Research Advisory Committee in Australia, or it's a Research Advisory Committee to smart, for smart, Austra smart Recovery in Australia, which is led by Professor Pete Kelly from University of Wollongong. And this comprises 10 clinicians and researchers from various universities who are really committed to building the evidence base. And we run a number of studies with, a, we've had around 20 peer review publications published to date. We're happy to share that bibliography with you. There's also the Global Research Advisory Committee, which brings together 12 international researchers who are driving and supporting the development of high quality, independent research and evaluation on smart recovery. And also to encourage any of you who are interested in smart recovery and its research to join the Global Research Network, which is free to join, it's free membership, and it's just a simple expression of interest form that needs to be submitted. We really encourage members who are established and early career researchers, students, recovery facilitators, volunteers, group participants, really anyone with an interest in smart recovery. The network aims to promote collaborative research and evaluation efforts, and really to help Smart Recovery International identify gaps in research that are needed to inform smart recovery programs and to ensure that any findings are communicated to participants and facilitators. So that's me done for today. I hope you've found it relevant and interesting and that it's given you a feel for what smart recovery can offer to clients. We're really happy to provide support and guidance to any service who wants to start running groups. We have so many great, really practical recommendations in the report that I'm happy to share with anybody who'd like to see it. We will have the executive summary uh, available on the Turning Point website as well. I just want to finish by thanking the incredible team and the many, many people that were involved in this study. Obviously the Department of Health are funding it, my co-investigators, Davinia, Michael and Catherine, as well as other key Turning Point staff, Carmen, Nicole and Anna. I'd like to thank Smart Recovery Australia, particularly Ange, Dan, Josette and the Research Advisory Committee for all their support. And importantly to the clinicians and peer facilitators and the service managers at Odyssey House, at e the Eastern Consortium of AOD Services and Ballarat Community Health Centres. And of course, the participants themselves for attending the groups and providing um, feedback and answering our questions in the surveys and the qualitative interviews. We're so grateful. I think it's been a really successful project. We're very proud of the work and we're really keen to see this go further. So um, that's, that's where I'd like to finish up today and, and to thank you for listening. And we're really happy now to take any questions. Thank you, Victoria and Dan. Um, we do have a lot of questions. I have tried to group them together because there were some similar questions. Um, we'll do our best to get through as many as we can. Um, there was a couple of questions about, can AOD workers attend the online meetings to get an understanding or some self-learning before referring clients? 
Yeah, for sure. I, I, I say, I've, I've seen all the questions there, so I can rattle through as many as I can. Great. Um, look, we're always supportive of, of people um, observing. I guess what's more important is the, the people, the participants, if they're attending these meetings, that they're comfortable with people observing what's going on. That's primarily the, the biggest barrier. Um, obviously, online groups make that a little bit easier. Um, and uh, there are opportunities to observe groups and even co-facilitate groups, you know, in, in the future, if, it's, if you're not quite comfortable with that as well. What I do say, though, is sometimes uh, I saw another question there about bringing, bringing your AOD worker because, you know, a participant might be anxious or they bring a friend with them and stuff. And, and to, to a degree, that's OK. Um, I always ask, you know, what is the intent of someone coming into that group? Um, I've had... Uh, couples coming in together and that's not always helpful sometimes it can be because it might be that very person that's annoying you <laughs> and, and triggering you so you know it makes the, the the honesty and the openness and the safety be an issue as well so I'm always asked the question of what is the purpose of people attending these and to make sure that the people that are there participating are comfortable for that to happen and if not they may be asked to leave I mean that's really uh, we want to allow the participants to self-manage that um, I saw quite a lot of questions. Do you want me to go through? Or you can direct whatever ones, Rebecca, you would like. Um, <laughs> okay, thanks. I'll, um, I'll ask them if, if that's okay. Yep. Um, there was a couple of questions also about, um, you know, how do you manage privacy and confidentiality? And if it's online, there's, you know, other family members in the house. Sure, sure. I mean, I guess uh, privacy and confidentiality can mean different things. I mean, we don't always know who are coming to the groups, whether that's the real name as such. Uh, we all would obviously have an IP address that we have, have, have secure, um, but the, that's the only information we have specifically online. Face to face, you don't know who this person would be. They literally just say their name and that's as much confidentiality. And within the group, obviously we adhere to those confidentiality policies. Um, online, what, what can happen, obviously, yes, I saw one of the questions, you can have your, your background off if you need be. We're trying to create rapport and cohesion it's much easier if we can see someone's face so you can blow your background what i would say is if you're going to be engaging in recovery support then you would probably want to find a, a place that's safe for you to, to share what you need to share uh, sometimes it's the family members as i said it could be triggering to that so maybe having it in, in, in the house where those members are is not the best thing so the beauty of it is that you can have it on your phone with headphones walking and sitting under a tree in the park you know, that's the, the thing with online you can engage anywhere you need to engage um and yeah we obviously need to maintain security so the facilitators are there if something is popping up or someone walks in then we would need to probably pause that video and just have a quiet private message to say it's not really appropriate having family members because there are people here that need to feel safe and secure you know so we do everything we can to try and maintain that as best we can thank you um how many people are typically in a group Depends on how many people want to turn up. Um, what I would say, the data collection comes across um, a, a assessment over many years, and the national average of face-to-face -face and online is about six or seven. Now, that's not to say you might get two, or you might be in a, a, an area where you're hardly getting any people, so we need to promote. But there are meetings that run with 20, uh, and we have different ways, different methods, when through the training of how to manage those larger groups and still maintain the integrity of the program. But not to freak you out, if you go into online America, there could be 80 people in the meetings. So it needs to be run slightly differently. Uh, but on national average, about six, I would say, is a good number to have. Yeah, I find it really varies according to, well, obviously during COVID, we've had a huge uptake. Um, some of the groups um, that are on the weekend on Saturdays have been really well attended. So, you know, sort of 25 plus people. It really depends on what's what's happening. And um, yeah, and it can be challenging, though, to, when you have that many to, to make sure that everybody gets to speak. But everybody's generally very accommodating and can recognise when to keep things a bit more succinct. Thank you. Um, do you offer smart recovery to teens? Teens? Yes. Yeah, yes, to young, to youth. young yeah. people. Yes, yeah. We, we've, um, we've, we've been embedded into places like Headspace for many years. Um, the training in itself, um, the, the core principles of it is the same, but we're working with um, organisations and research to look at ways of adapting that. We have a pilot study called Start Smart. Um, which is a, around uh, early interventions as well. So 
uh, it's just looking at different ways to implement that and, and understanding the kind of development stages of youth and teenagers and what way that's uh, delivered uh, more effectively. So we definitely um, have them embedded in these youth services, but we're looking into the research around to improve that even more uh, better down the track. Thank you. Now, how do people access facilitator training and is there any reduced cost um, of the training for consumers? Yeah, for sure, sure. So um, just on our website, um, so I'm just going to post it in the chat. Um, go to the website, we'll get all the information you need. Uh, under the training section, there's options for online and face-to-face -face training. Um, the online training is uh, flexible to whatever your needs are, how many services people you have in your service, whatever wants to do it. Face-to-face -face training can be pre-booked um, as an organization. If you've got eight people all want trained at one go, we can come and travel to your state, to your city, and train, train as part of that fee, the, the flights and everything's covered in the part of that. Um, but then we need to have a certain amount of people to come do that, or we would advertise them in some of the major cities. So hopefully see that increase as well. Um, but yes, we offer peer program as well. So people that have had nine months under their belt of some stability or demonstrated behavioral change, we're not talking about pure abstinence because you might be on a methadone program or something, and that's stability for you. But we can, uh, those that have attended at least three months of that in smart recovery can go and do the training for an absolutely minimal admin cost and we will continue to support them uh, in their professional development as well which i've lost count how many references i've given to volunteer peers that have ended up getting jobs just for simply facilitating smart which is fantastic thank you dan um can participants attend uh if they're substance affected well, it all comes down to, because we're a harm minimization approach, it all comes down to, is it detrimental to anyone else in the group? Um, are they causing disruption? Mm -hmm. Are they triggering other people? Now, the difficulty of that is that someone could be on medication or have a, an acquired brain injury and people think they're, they're wasted. We, we can't presume that. So what I would always encourage having a co-facilitator, someone to vet people at the door, you would tend to you know, see people or know people that have, you know, you may know them already, so you'll know where the baseline is and you might be able just to negotiate so that when you do sit down, it's a fairly safe space. If someone then starts presenting that they are, then we will be asking them to leave if they are disruptive to, to the process. But for sure, because it's not pure abstinence, there may be, but we just don't know. We don't know how many people have done this and what they've done that day. But as long as they're not causing a disruption, they're not triggering people with a smell, or they're you know just clearly under the influence, then we would manage that. But for sure, if it's harm minimization, we can't expect everyone to be abstinent to come into the door. Thank you, Dan. I'm just conscious of the time. Um, we did have a number of questions. Um, I'll just ask two more. Um, can smart recovery be adapted to one-on-one -on -one sessions at all? Well, I think you can in the sense that uh, it's cognitive behavioural and therapy and motivational interviewing principles. So um, what I would say is the true essence of smart recovery is the smart self-management and mutual aid. So it's very difficult to have mutual aid when there's only one on one. So the real strength comes from the mutual aid as well. But for sure, what I do find is that you, you people have done the training and uh, it's improved their one to one clinical style because of the way that you are as a facilitator in the group, you can still get, uh, I guess it refreshes that motivational interviewing type skills that, 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 you, that you sometimes forget so easily. Uh, even Bill Miller himself, when I interviewed him, saying he's still learning motivational interviewing. I'm saying, Bill, you invented it. <laughs> You're still learning it, but it was an encouragement to us all. So practice, practice. I even practice sometimes when I'm having a meeting with my wife and I call it a meeting because I have kids and we don't have dates anymore. Um, but. I find that I go into facilitator mode and she's like, check you out. I'm, I'm not meaning to. It's just because I've been practicing it so much. It just comes a bit more fluently. Um, so for sure you can, but it's not going to be true mutual aid then. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Thank you. So I am actually going to ask two more. Sorry. Okay. Um, what would be the significant differences between SMART and 12-step programs? Look, it's, it's a tricky one to answer as well. And I want to prefix it with, this is not competition. Mm. This is not an alternative. It's another option. And we have many people that come through 12 Steps that will go to SMART as well. I've run 12 Steps. I've taken part in 12 Steps in my life. So I see the advantage in the, in, in, of both of them working together. 
Um, but I think a big part of it is around the, the, the public psychology, evidence-based nature of it, but also um, it, the real practical nature of it and it, the harm minimization approach, which is something that um, my experience even running 12 Steps is a lot of abstinence focused. It's a lot about, um, you know, believing that you're powerless over this, but we are believing that this is a behavior that you can change and you can transcend and you can find freedom in this. I'm not saying you don't need to forget where you've come from and what you, what you, 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 you the, the, the issues you've had with alcohol or whatever, but we're trying to, as I say, destigmatize it. I don't need to be labeling myself as an alcoholic. I'm actually Dan, I'm a father, I'm a, I'm a brother, I am this and that, and there's so much to me, rather than just taking that and, and finding true freedom in that, that you can transcend those, those behaviours, uh, and we'll never be perfect, we'll continue working these behaviours through the whole of our life, but it does find uh, that, that there's a lot of people find the stigmatising nature, or the, the lack of, um, when they come to smart recoveries, encouraging, so... Thank you. Now, this really is the final question. And apologies to everyone that did ask other questions. Um, I'm interested to hear more about the Family Friends Program and how it integrates with the smart recovery groups. Yeah, well, it's really up to the individuals whether it integrates or not. Um, you know, services that run Family Friends would have done the basic training. They probably are likely have to run, run normal smart recovery meetings. But if they feel the need or they have funding that want to support family members through that as well, then they can do the training, which is additional to that. And um, that's an eight session course, as I said, that can run a couple of times through the year. Um, so it would really be whether someone approaches and maybe uh, a family member seeking help engages as family and friends, but through those conversations, through um, Jimmy, seeing their parents changing and just be more supportive and more engaging They'll be interested and they can have those conversations well i've been going to this and this has really worked for me Are you can we do this together you know so it's not that it's a program that that can intertwine but it's really up to the individuals whether they want to or not and whether their family members want to engage in that type of support but. thank you so much i'm so sorry to um have to end it now but thank you um dan and victoria and thank you everyone for attending today um, Dan's popped up the Smart Recovery uh, website. The slides will come uh, in the near future. Yeah. And if you could all please complete the feedback, um, that'd be fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, guys.